The nurses looked extremely concerned. Doctor, we really need to admit him. I don't think that he is faking it. I really think that he needs our help. Him? Forget it. He's probably just a gang member. Black guys like him usually are. Hi there. My name is Joel, and I love to travel. My journeys have taken me all over the world, and I have many amazing stories to tell. But right now, I want to tell you about the one time that I got so angry that I kind of did something really illegal. But hear me out. I promise that I was justified. For starters, I'm 32 years old, and I grew up and live in South Africa. But I speak English perfectly. When I was young, I would look at the globe that my father kept in his office, and I would dream about visiting all of the countries of the world. It was something that I wanted to do more than anything else. And when I got older and became a surgeon, I finally had enough money that I could go on a trip to a new destination several times a year. I've been to every continent except Antarctica, but eventually, I plan to go even there. This story, however, occurred when visited the United States. It wasn't the first time that I went there, but it was the first time that I had major problems. You see, I went to Houston for the first time, and I was having a wonderful time when suddenly I began to feel ill. My abdomen was in agony. The pain was so bad that I nearly was passing out. Instantly, I suspected that it might be appendicitis, and so I rushed to the hospital. However, that was when things began to go downhill fast. What is this man doing here? He's complaining about abdominal pain, doctor. Look at him. He's just trying to get some painkillers. His kind always does. No, sir. That isn't true. It's probably appendicitis. Please run some tests. Appendicitis? And how would someone like you know that? Please believe me. I'm a surgeon. A surgeon? You've got to be kidding me. See, I knew that he was lying. There's no way that he's a surgeon. There's nothing that his kind won't be lie about. I was in such pain that I couldn't argue with him. Instead, I sat in the waiting room and assumed that if things got worse, that they would have helped me. Which, at the rate at which the pain was increasing, I assumed that it wouldn't be very long. As I sat there, I could hear the nurses begging the doctor to help me, but he kept glaring at me and refused to admit me. There were a few times when I passed out from the pain, and when I woke up, the nurses looked extremely concerned. Doctor, we really need to admit him. I don't think that he is faking it. I really think that he needs our help. Him? Forget it. He's probably just a gang member. Black guys like him usually are. I didn't know how much more I could take. The pain was almost too much to bear. I was suffering so much that I was drenched in sweat and couldn't even stand up anymore, or even see straight. It was clear that I had a very high fever, and it was only getting worse. Finally, the doctor came back out to the waiting room, and for a brief moment, I thought that he had finally changed his mind. But boy, was I mistaken. Why are you still here? Everyone can see that you're just faking it. You're doing a good job, so I can assume that maybe you're an actor of some sort, but I'm not falling for it. Please, sir. I'm not faking it. I'm in incredible agony. My appendix is going to burst any second. Just stop already. Why do you people constantly come in here looking for painkillers? You should be ashamed of yourself. Just then, another doctor came in. The second that she came in, she noticed the other doctor speaking to me and came over to see what was going on. Hey, what's going on over here? It's just some gangbanger looking for a drug fix. She took one look at me and got extremely angry. Are you kidding me? He's burning up. Nurse, admit this man immediately and run some tests and put a rush on getting those results. Thankfully, the nurses listened to her and rushed me into the examination room. They ran several tests and also prepared the operating room for me, as the doctor suspected just as I did. Sure enough, when the tests came back, they showed that I had been correct, and I was prepped and rushed up to the operating room. When I finally woke up, I was still in pain, but it wasn't nearly as bad as it was before my surgery. The female doctor that had been my savior walked into my room to check on me. Hello there, Joel. How are you feeling? Much better now. How bad was it? If we hadn't admitted you when we did, then you probably would have died in that waiting room. I was worried that that would happen. Thank you for admitting me when you did. What was wrong with that other doctor, though? Yeah, sorry about him. I've tried to get him fired so many times. He's incredibly racist, and I can only imagine the kinds of things that go on when I'm not here. In fact, I was planning to take the day off, but my plans were canceled at the last minute, and so I came into work. Well, thank you. I'm sorry but I'm really happy that your plans were canceled. Truly, I owe you my life. She laughed 
and then continued to do her rounds. That whole day, I was very groggy and trying to recover from my surgery. Every now and then, I would see the male doctor that had nearly cost me my life. He would just walk by and glare at me menacingly. Towards the end of the day, he came into my room to threaten me. Listen, yeah, maybe I was wrong, but if you know what's good for you, you'll just take your pain meds and leave as soon as you can. Oh, are you just scared that I might get you reported for incompetence? No one will believe even if you did. They'll know better than to trust a black guy. What is wrong with you? I would never treat a patient the way you have treated me. This is absolutely unconscionable. I don't care what you think. You just better be gone first thing in the morning. Or else I'll make sure that you don't walk out the hospital at all. Yeah, I couldn't believe that he was speaking to me that way. I could only imagine how many people that he had hurt over the years because he was turning people away from the hospital. I didn't know what I could do, but then I looked out into the hallway and saw a bucket of water and some cleaning supplies sitting on the ground near to an emergency exit. A dark thought instantly formed in my mind. I knew that the doctor would be walking by my room at least once more, as the elevator was near to my room, and so even though it was really hard for me to do so, I managed to sneak out of my room. I quickly checked the hallway to make sure that the coast was clear, and then I propped the door to the stairwell open, and then dumped all the water and cleaning supplies on the ground, and then returned to my room to wait. I didn't have to wait long when I heard the doctor coming down the hallway. Once he was outside my door, I rushed him with all the energy I could muster and shoved him onto the tiled floor where I had dumped the chemicals and water. It didn't take much to get him to slip and be sent flying across the hallway and through the open door and into the stairwell. My intentions were for him to fall down one flight, but since he was covered in the fluids, he kept falling down the stairs until he fell all the way from the sixth floor that we had been on to the ground floor. Carefully, I crept back to my room and tried to go to sleep to make it look like I hadn't done anything at all. In the morning, I checked myself out of the hospital and quickly made my way to the airport and flew home. I was terrified that I would get in trouble for what I had done, but no one had stopped me leaving the country. When I got home, I looked up online to see if anyone had reported about what had happened, and I was shocked to see that the local news had reported a terrible tragedy at the hospital that I had been admitted to. They reported that a doctor had a terrible accident and had slipped on spill and had severely injured himself falling down several flights of stairs. The injuries were so severe that he was forced to retire as he would never be able to perform surgery again and had lost the ability to walk. Part of me felt guilty for just how badly he had been injured, but a much larger part of me felt that I had gotten justice for all the people that he had no doubt hurt over the many years of his career and all the people that he might have hurt had I done nothing. So tell me, was I in the wrong? The day of my son's burial finally came. However, right in the middle of it, my phone rang. I looked at it, and it was Mrs. Julie. It's been a week, Mason. Why aren't you in school, you idiot? I'm burying my son right now. Please. I can't argue right now. Wow. You've grown some wings, haven't you? Let me tell you this, Mason. If you don't get your stupid ass here tomorrow, you're fired. What? You heard me right. Get yourself here tomorrow or forget about being a teacher. Before I could speak, my wife took the phone from me. Hi, my name is Mason. Mrs. Julie was employed into the college in my third year of teaching the students. She had a higher position than I did, so she was my superior. On the first day, she seemed nice and calm. But on the second day, her true self came out. A pure bully, that woman. Whenever the school's president was present, she would pretend to be kind and gentle. However, once he turned his back, she became the direct opposite. I'd caught her countless times bullying the students. Are you going to walk by without greeting me? I said hi just now, ma'am. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Well, since you're going to argue with me, you'll be in trouble for the whole of your time in this school. Asshole. She was a pest to both students and us teachers. She would step on us intentionally if we had our legs out unknowingly while she's walking by. She never carried her bag herself. Sometimes, she would make some of the students drive her home in her car. I'd caught her thrice. I tried to confront her the first time. This isn't right, Mrs. Juliet. You shouldn't let these students take you home. And who the hell do you think you are to tell me what to do, you freak? 
I know I'm just a junior teacher, but we're both teachers here. Stop letting them take you home and get a driver. I see you've got the balls. Let's see you repeat this next month. At the moment, I didn't understand what she meant by then. However, after that month ended and it got to the time when we received our pay, I understood. The school did this thing where they handed our salaries to the head teacher, who in turn pays it to us and take our signatures of confirmation to them. Now, being the teacher with the highest position, Mrs. Julie became in charge of it. When I counted my money after she handed me my envelope, it was incomplete. This isn't my complete salary, Mrs. Julie. Why did you cut it short? Oh, I used it to get you more balls, stupid. You wanted to teach me how to do my job, right? Well, I've learnt. I won't take this. I'm going to report to the school authorities. Oh, please, go. I dare you to tell them. You'll get fired immediately. Try me. I boiled with rage as she stormed off. I hated her. The other teachers consoled me and asked me not to think too much about it. I agreed. She only cut $100, and I still had $2,600 left, so I accepted to forget about it. Another day, I caught her threatening to kill the students. If this ever gets to the college president, I'll kill y'all myself. I couldn't help but wonder what led to that. She must have done something really bad to them. I could tell how scared they were. She proceeded to telling them stories of people she'd murdered and even showed some pictures. I burst into the class immediately. Why are you doing this? I'm going to report you this time. All right, Mr. Mason. I guess you want to be cut short by 300 buck this month. Go on. I dare you. What is wrong with this? Mrs. Julie, I shamefully walked out of the class, sad that I hadn't been able to save them. However, I was sure she would meet her karma very soon. A month later, a young and beautiful female teacher was employed. Mrs. Julie seemed to be the happiest among us. I knew the reason was because another person had been brought in to enjoy her bullying. Two days later, my phone rang in the middle of teaching. It was my wife. I wondered what had happened as she never called during school hours. I excused myself and went to pick up the call outside. What's the problem, honey? It's Jacob. He's dying. He suddenly fainted and has refused to wake up. Come back home right now. I was confused. My son was dying. I quickly returned to the class and told the students I won't be able to continue with them. After apologizing, I ran all the way to the staff's building, grabbed my bag, and stormed out. I was going to stop by the president's office to take a permission to leave. I would go to Mrs. Julie, but that witch would never grant me permission. I reached the president's and met my worst enemy there. What are you doing here? My wife just called to tell me my son is dying. I have to leave right now, please. He's my only child. I can't let him die. Oh, my only child died too. You'll be fine if he dies. Return to the class. I was shocked. How could she say that? I felt bad to hear that she lost her only child. But how could she wish mine dead too? I can't let him die. Mr. Daniel, please let me go. Please. I was on my knees, begging the school's president. He let out a sigh and finally granted me permission. I thanked him and dashed out of the office, ignoring Mrs. Julie's loud screams daring me to leave. On getting home, I realized I was late. My son had died already. I fell on my knees, my heart shattered. It was my fault for not coming to take him early to the hospital. My wife was in heavy tears, holding his lifeless body. We took him to the morgue while we planned his funeral. He was our only child, so he deserved one. It was a tough period for me, so I couldn't call the school. However, I wrote an email to the head of the school, explaining the whole thing to him and requesting for a two weeks leave. It took a whole day before he responded. He expressed his condolences to my family and I and told me I could take the leave. I was thankful for his understanding. The day of my son's burial finally came. However, right in the middle of it, my phone rang. I looked at it and it was Mrs. Julie. I answered the call. It's been a week, Mason. Why aren't you in school, you idiot? I'm burying my son right now. Please. I can't argue right now. Wow. You've grown some wings, haven't you? Let me tell you this, Mason. If you don't get your stupid ass here tomorrow, you're fired. What? You heard me right. Get yourself here tomorrow or forget about being a teacher. Before I could speak, my wife took the phone from me. What do you want, bitch? My son is dead and we're burying him right now. Can you let us be? And who the hell are you? I am Mason's wife. You want to fire him, right? Fine. 
Do whatever you want, you evil wench. I told her about Mrs. Julie's bullying, and my wife seriously hated her. I took the phone from my wife as she began crying. Everyone present at the funeral was staring at us. It's already a sad day for us, Mrs. Julie. Please, don't worsen it. Are you being like this because you lost a mere child? Well, I don't care. Be at the school tomorrow or you're fired. You don't have to fire me. I quit. You can have my job as yours and continue bullying the students. I don't care. I quit. Great. Quit, coward. This- I hung up, not wanting to listen to get stupid thoughts any longer. The funeral finished, and we all left for our homes. Idiot had seriously quit? If he comes back begging, I won't forgive him. I'm going to let him beg me in front of everyone and chase him out. I, I, I knew I'd still get my job because I took permission from the president, but I needed to teach that Mrs. Julie a lesson. She probably didn't know that the school's president had granted me a two weeks leave. After the two weeks elapsed, I returned to school. As Mrs. Julie tried to stop me from going in, I showed her the email between the president and I, and she said shocked. I brushed her off and went in. On getting to the staff's building, I saw the young teacher on the floor, in pain. I quickly rushed to her and demanded what happened. Mrs. Julie broke my wrist while fighting with me. She wanted my seat, but I was busy, so I refused to stand up. In anger, she began fighting me. In a bid to defend myself, she intertwined our fingers and pushed my hands back, breaking my wrist bones. Quickly, get the president here. I quickly dashed out of the building and began running to the president's office. However, on my way, I caught Mrs. Julie fighting with a student. I continued my journey to the president's office. Immediately I told him about what happened, he yelled out. What? My daughter! Daddy! I was shocked. She was the president's daughter. The president lifted her up. He told me he was taking her to the hospital, but I needed him to also witness Mrs. Julie bullying the students. Fortunately, he agreed and followed me. We reached the class and caught her right in the act of punishing the students. She was hitting two students at the same time. The president left without a word. I smiled at Mrs. Julie in a mocking way before leaving too. The next day, the president returned to the school with his daughter, her hands wrapped with heavy bandage. Mrs. Julie was in a class again. The president confronted her, and Mrs. Julie was shocked to hear that the teacher was his daughter. I... 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 Shut up, Julie. You hurt my daughter. Mason and the other teachers have told me how mean you've been to them. I also caught you beating up the students. You're going to face punishment for this. Mrs. Julie tried to apologize, but it was too late. She was sued for by we the teachers for bullying. The president's daughter sued her for physical abuse, and the students sued her for bullying, physical, and emotional abuse. It was quite a lot of charges, and no one was willing to drop any. Everyone wanted her to be punished. She was sacked and asked to pay a total of $300,000. Mrs. Julie burst into tears, complaining about not having that much amount to pay. The judge told her if she didn't pay up in six months, she'd be imprisoned for a very long time. Mrs. Julie was fired from the school. With her entire savings, she paid $10,000 out of the fine. She went on to get a part-time cleaning job at a restaurant after getting rejected from other places. One day, I visited the restaurant and found her trying to be her authoritative self, but the young boy in charge quickly stopped her. Shut it, old hag. If you try to change the rules here one more time, you'll get fired. You're only a part-time cleaner here. Know your place. Immediately after, I dropped the glass of wine in my hand and pretended it was a mistake. The boy ordered Mrs. Julie to come clean up the mess. Without arguing, she walked over to my table and began cleaning it. I stood up to leave but not before mistakenly pushing her to fall. I paid the boy and left him a tip. I find it very hard to have any sympathy for her at all. I saw it on the newspaper a few months later that Mrs. Julie was beaten up by an angry customer and she had permanent scars from the beating. Unfortunately, the guy was never caught and no man will want to settle down with a woman with such attitude and scars. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment down below saying I subscribed and we will try our best to reply to your comment. Close to midnight, I heard someone on the front porch, followed a few seconds later by a window in the living room breaking, and then in the darkness, I saw my mother-in-law slip through the broken window. That was it though. I had had enough, 
and before she could gather her wits and figure out where to go to find my kids, I attacked her. I was just filled with blind rage, and I must have hit her with the bat over a dozen times. Part of me realized that I was overreacting just a bit, but I wasn't taking any chances. I had already lost my wife. I wasn't also going to lose my boys. After I realized that she was unconscious, I called the police and had them come out and arrest her for breaking and entering. Most people have mother-in-laws that are fairly decent people that they get along with quite well, but there are some that have quite the adversarial relationship like myself. Although after I tell you my story, maybe you might just agree with me that there aren't many that have mother-in-laws as bad as mine. To start with, my name is Joseph, and it's important that I mention that I had known my wife, Bethany, for several years. We had been friends for many years, and neither of us had had a lot of luck when it came to finding love, and one day we just looked at each other, realized that maybe we should give dating each other a try. Once we did, we realized that we should have done so sooner, as we were an amazing match for one another. Our friendship quickly blossomed into love. For the first time in my whole life, I felt truly happy and complete, but there were some hiccups on the horizon unfortunately. The day came when we thought that it was time that we should introduce each other to our parents. It wasn't that we wanted their approval, really, but we felt that it was important that they know about each other since things were getting rather serious. And, I'll be honest, I was beginning to plan just how I was going to propose to Bethany. We decided to introduce Bethany to my parents first, and it went rather well, actually. My parents truly seemed to like her, and I was incredibly relieved, but then it became my turn to meet Bethany's mother. Her father had passed away many years ago, and we were hopeful that maybe one day that she might move in with us. We were worried that she had been lonely since her husband had passed away, but boy, were we wrong. On the day that we invited her out for lunch to tell her about us, we had expected that she would take the news quite well and be happy for us. Hey mom, so Joseph and I have some amazing news. We've moved on from being friends to dating. Mom, we are in love. With this loser? Please tell me that you're joking. Mom! What are you talking about? I thought that you liked Joseph? Well, you thought wrong. I can't believe that you would want to date such a weak and pathetic man. Why can't you find a man like your father? He was such a handsome man and so strong, and Joseph just looks like he can't fight his way out of a wet paper bag. It's okay, Bethany. She's allowed to not like me. But we had always thought that you did. Well, that just proves how stupid that you are to think something so incredibly foolish. I had no words to describe how awkward things felt after that. But Bethany and I loved each other, and we didn't really care whether or not she hated me. We had decided that we wanted to be with one another, and whether she approved or not wasn't our problem. Soon after that, I proposed to Bethany, and she accepted. Even though her mother clearly wouldn't be happy about it, we were ecstatic. Oddly enough, Bethany's mother was fairly quiet during the entire wedding, but it was plainly obvious that she was not happy about us getting married. Despite this, we enjoyed our new lives together and bought a small quaint house and started to try to have children. Both Bethany and I wanted to have kids, and we figured that we may as well start as soon as possible. The day that Bethany told me that she was pregnant was among the happiest days of my life, and when we found out that it was going to be twins as well, made us incredibly happy. For the first time since we had told Bethany's mother about our relationship, she actually seemed happy about our union. Oh, this is quite the happy the day. I can't wait to meet my grandchildren. I'm going to bring them everywhere with me. Thank you, Mom. We're so happy that you are eager to babysit them. For sure, we'll happily need you to watch them from time to time. Babysit? Oh yes, I guess it would be temporary, right? I found it quite the odd thing to say, but at least she was no longer calling me names and was supportive for once. She still gave me dirty looks, but at least she no longer was insulting me. The pregnancy was incredibly difficult for Bethany, and she had to go on an early maternity leave and the doctor warned us that things could be very dangerous for Bethany. We of course followed every direction the doctors gave us to try to make things safer and easier on Bethany and the twins. But the day that she went into labor, it wasn't looking very good. Bethany was in labor for over 24 hours. I was so incredibly worried and the longer that it went on, the more I was worried that I was going to lose Bethany and the babies. Then the doctor came out of the delivery room and the look on his face caused my heart to shatter. I'm so sorry, Joseph, but it was too much. We did save the twin boys, they are alive and well, but Bethany passed away. I am so very sorry. I went numb. Part of me was filled with relief that my children were alive, but at the same time I couldn't imagine my life without Bethany. 
I wish I could say that I manned up and did what needed to be done, but I went catatonic and couldn't focus on anything. I was able to tell the doctor that both Bethany and I had wanted to name them Charlie and Edward, but after that, I was silent. Bethany's mother stepped up and helped out. She planned the funeral for me and even helped to care for the babies until I was finally able to come to terms with my loss. My parents helped as well, but Bethany's mother did most of the work. A few months after Bethany's death, I was still deep in my grief, but I was finally able to help out with the babies. Hey, what can I do to help? Can I feed them? No, just go back to doing nothing. Clearly, that's all you're good for. Sorry, but I was pretty distraught after losing my wife. But I've recovered enough from the trauma, and I would like to start bonding with the children that my wife and I wanted so much. Well, that really isn't up to you. I'm their caregiver now. Just make yourself useful and jump off a bridge. I couldn't believe her response. It was so callous and cold, and I had honestly thought that the loss of Bethany had finally made her see the light and to forget her hatred of me. But of course not. Da -da -da. The next day, some police officers showed up and asked to be let into the house. Sir, we are sorry to bother you, but we had reports of someone selling drugs. Can we come in and have a look around? Drugs? Um, no one here is selling drugs but you can absolutely come in and check. I was so confused, but I let them inside and they searched my home, but after they found nothing, they apologized and left. That was when Bethany's mother came out and had an incredibly sour look on her face. What were they doing here? Did they find your stash? What stash? Did you call them and get them to come out here? Why would you do that? Of course I did. You're absolutely useless and I need you gone so that I can raise my children in peace. Your children? What are you talking about? You're only their grandmother. Honestly, you've overstayed your welcome. I think it would be best if you were to leave. If you are going to pull stunts like that, then you need to leave. You can either leave now on your own, or I can call the police back and have them drag you away. Surprisingly, she left without another word, but I knew that that wasn't going to be the last of things, and so I made plans to go and stay with my parents just in case. I packed up everything that my boys would need and drove over to their house. The next day, more police officers showed up at my parents' home. I wish I could say that I was surprised, but I truly wasn't. Hi there, sir. Listen, we got a call that you were shaking your child in your home earlier today and that you made threats against their grandmother this morning. Can you give us your statement on what happened? Well, I can tell you that it's a complete lie since I've been here at my parents' home since early yesterday afternoon. They can vouch for that. I haven't seen their grandmother since yesterday morning and I would never in a million years shake my boys. Their grandmother is just filing false reports in an attempt to get me in trouble so she can take the boys away from me. My parents gave their testimonies and the police inspected my sons and saw how happy and healthy they were. And so they apologized once again and left, but not before telling me that they would be filing false allegation charges against my mother-in-law. I wasn't going to hold my breath, of course, though, and I just figured that maybe that would the end of it for a bit. Although I would need to speak to a lawyer about getting a restraining order against my mother-in-law and possibly what else I could do to stop her from calling the police and making false reports about me. However, that night, I got a notification from my security system that someone had broken into my home. When the police showed up, they didn't find anyone, and thankfully, nothing was taken. And so I just knew that it had been my mother-in-law. After I got off the phone with them, I knew that there was a chance that she might come to my parents' house next and try to break in and kidnap my children. Knowing this, after my parents went to bed, I turned off all the lights and waited in the living room in the dark with a baseball bat. I knew that there was a high chance that my mother-in-law wouldn't come to their house the same night, but I wasn't taking any risks. Close to midnight, I heard someone on the front porch, followed a few seconds later by a window in the living room breaking, and then in the darkness, I saw my mother-in-law slip through the broken window. That was it though. I had had enough, and before she could gather her wits and figure out where to go to find my kids, I attacked her. I was just filled with blind rage and I must have hit her with the bat over a dozen times. Part of me realized that I was overreacting just a bit, but I wasn't taking any chances. I had already lost my wife. I wasn't also going to lose my boys. After I realized that she was unconscious, I called the police and had them come out and arrest her for breaking and entering. Since the also was carrying rope, zip ties, and had baby seats on the porch, it was plainly obvious that she had been planning to kidnap my boys as well. They hauled her away to jail. A short time later, she was put in front of a judge, and he deemed her unfit to stand trial on account of being mentally unwell, but he did force her to be sent to a treatment facility. It amounted to essentially going to prison, 
but was more like a hospital with armed guards. Even though it wasn't prison, I still felt very safe though, as apparently when I had attacked her, I had done serious damage to her spine, and she was confined to a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Seeing as how I was grief-stricken and had merely been defending my family, I had been let off with a warning and community service for attacking her. Part of me really regrets that it had gone down like that though. After all, she was my wife's mother and my son's grandmother, but I truly didn't have a choice. At least, I don't think I did. What do you think? My husband's is way better than our son. I'm glad I married him. Well, that's nice. My wedding dress was better than yours. Ugh, you look ugly in that. How could you even choose such an ugly dress? Hello, my name is Ava. You might be wondering how I got into such a situation with my mother-in-law. Well, buckle up. I'm about to take you on a long story drive. I met Steve when he got transferred to the company I worked for. I mean, it wasn't hard to find him when he became the talk of the company in barely three days after his arrival. Steve is a handsome man. All of the ladies took a liking to him and were all flocking around him every opportunity they got. It was like no other man existed in the company after his arrival. I wasn't among those ladies. I mean, yes, he was handsome, but I didn't see it as a sensible behavior to always be around him. Perhaps he took a liking to me as a result of my calmness. He was always coming over to talk to me, something the other ladies dreamed of. We became friends and soon proceeded to dating. A year later, Steve proposed to me. I was overjoyed. I loved him so much. I'll be taking you to my parents tomorrow. Oh, true. I have to meet them. I'm so nervous. You don't have to be. My parents are nice. You'll love them. He'd always told me about how nice his parents were. I mean, my nervousness was justified. It's quite a huge deal meeting up with your fiancé's parents for the first time. I worried a lot about whether they'll like me or not. The next day, I dressed up in a new dress I got for the introduction, and Steve came to pick me up. Together, we left for his parents' home. Arriving there, we met just his dad at home. He was surprised to see Steve home with a lady. Apparently, it was the first time he would be hearing about his son's relationship. The man received me warmly. I was very comfortable around him. However, everything changed once his mother walked in. Who's she? She's my fiance, mom. Fiance, you didn't tell me you had a girlfriend. I greeted her, but she ignored me. I believe that it was because she was surprised to meet a stranger in her house. So, I greeted her again. Her reply was rather absurd. Your dress, it's a cheap one, isn't it? You can't afford the real design of that dress. But it is the real... She interrupted me. You don't have to lie, darling. Your hair, did you even brush it? Who did your makeup? Must be a cheap artist. And your bag, I guess it's fake too. <laughs> she was being so rude to me, but I managed to maintain a calm expression even though I was boiling within myself. Stop it, mom. You're being ridiculous and rude to Ava. Dad, say something. Ignore her, kids. Ava, darling, would you like some tea? No, thanks. I, I have to leave now. I have an important place to be at. And what would be more important than spending time with your fiancé's parents? Your rude girl sh That's enough, Mom. You've made her uncomfortable enough. Let's go, Ava. How could you do that to her? That was unfair and uncalled for. Shut up, idiot. You have no right to speak, okay? I overheard that on our way out and felt so bad for his father. Steve drove me home and apologized to me. I'm truly sorry about my mom's behavior. I have no idea why she was being like that. It's fine, Steve. We went on with our wedding plans. His mother forced herself to be involved in every single thing. On the day I went to shop for my wedding dress, she went with me instead of my best friend, against what I'd planned. I couldn't refuse her coming with me, so I asked my best friend to book a makeup artist for me instead. However, no dress I tried on was good enough in the eyes of my mother-in-law. Too ugly. Are you this skinny or is it the dress? That looks like it would be better on me instead. I don't think the dresses are ugly. I think it's you who has a bad body shape and makes all the dresses appear ugly. I was fed up. I stopped showing them to her and instead picked the one I loved. I had it packaged while we went to select my heels. Oh no, you've got really big feet, too huge for a woman. I don't think you'll get your size here. The attendant who'd helped with the wedding dress was forced to butt in. I think you're wrong, ma'am. The young miss has beautiful small feet. We use feet like these to model our products. I think you're wrong about yours being smaller. They are, in fact, huge. Shut up, fool. How dare you say that about me? Her feet are huge and ugly. The attendant ignored her. 
She brought me a variety of beautiful heels and assisted me in picking the most beautiful one. I ignored my mother-in-law who was fuming at a corner. We paid and left. On our way home, she began to say bad and hurtful things to me. Are you gonna shave your eyebrows? They look awful. Countless people have told me my eyebrows are the most beautiful features of my face. I couldn't understand what her problem was. I'm going to be dressed so beautifully tomorrow. Don't be angry if the guests ignore you and stare at me instead. You know I'm more beautiful. Can you stop, mother? I need to talk to Steve. Steve isn't a beautiful name. I guess I knew he was going to get married to an ugly woman. I'm so glad I gave him an ugly name. Steve doesn't have an ugly name. What? Are you talking back to me? How dare you, you poor orphan? I'm not an orphan. I told you my mother is busy. Only my father's dead, okay? Well, you're fatherless and have a mother who doesn't care about you. You're better off an orphan, darling. I was hurt by her words, but I held my tongue and said nothing to her. She fed on my responses, so I refused to give her any. The wedding day finally arrived. I was in the room with my best friend. She was assisting me in getting into my wedding dress as it was quite long. The instant we finished, the door burst open and my mother-in-law walked in. She burst out laughing. Oh my God, Ava, how can you be so ugly in everything? This is the dress you hid from me. Honestly, you look like a monster. You're wrong, ma'am. She looks beautiful. Stop lying to her. She doesn't. Ugh, Steve has a very bad taste in women. Mother. My husband's way better than our son. I'm glad I married him. Well, congratulations. I'm glad you married him too. My wedding dress was better than yours. Ugh, you look ugly in that. How could you even choose such an ugly dress? I chose this because I love it, mother. I ex Of course, ugly people love things similar to them. Why haven't you done your makeup yet? I explained that the makeup artist hadn't arrived. Right about the same time, my best friend got a call. It was the makeup artist. She'd been involved in an accident and wouldn't be able to make it. I was immediately thrown into a state of panic. I'm not good at it. Neither is my best friend. What should I do? Well, you're lucky I'm great at it. I'll help you. I was quite skeptical about letting her touch my face, and so was my best friend. But at that moment, we had no choice. My mother-in-law truly always had great makeup on, so I believed she would do a nice one on me. She left the room and returned with her makeup kit. She asked my best friend to get her a pack of wipes from her car as she'd forgotten to bring it along. My best friend left, leaving my mother-in-law and I alone. My mother-in-law brought out a small jar and began mixing different colors in it with water. I asked what she was doing and she replied that she mostly used it to add a special look to her makeup. I foolishly believed her. She soon got started with the makeup. I noticed she was moving very fast. When she was done, she grabbed the jar, but it slipped from her hand and landed on my dress, staining it deeply. Oops, I mistakenly stained your dress. I guess you might have to change it then. Right then, my best friend walked in. There was no pack of wipes in her car. My mother-in-law had tricked her. I was angry and hurt. How could you do this to me? I've done nothing but respect you, but all you've ever done is talk down on me continuously. Did I make a mistake by loving your son and accepting to marry him? I dashed out of the room in tears, forgetting that the guests were already present. My mother-in-law and best friend followed behind me, both trying to stop me. I bumped into Steve, who was with my mom, and his dad. Honey, what happened to you? Who did this to your dress and face, baby? I suddenly saw the eyes watching us, but I didn't care. I'd had enough of the woman's bullying. Your mother did this to me. She calls me ugly at the slightest chance, says horrible things to me. But all I've ever done is respect her regardless. If she hates me this much, I don't think I can go ahead with this wedding. What's wrong with you, mom? How dare you do this to my only child? How could you make her feel so bad about herself even on her big day? You, you're Ava's mom. Yes, are you surprised? You called me an orphan, didn't you? You mocked me so badly because my father is dead. Well, here's my mother. My mother owns a popular clothing brand. She was always busy, making her barely around. However, she'd spoken to Steve countless times and had planned to get to know his parents on our wedding day. I'm so sorry. I had no idea about you being her mother. Well, keep your sorry to yourself, mother. You've done enough to Ava. You've always been like this. You compared me severely to my peers while I was growing up. At a point, you made me lose my self-esteem. You did the same to dad when he lost his job, almost pushing him to committing suicide. That's enough now. You're no longer my mother, and I don't need you around me anymore. Get lost. Steve, baby, you can't do this to your mother. Honey, say something. 
I've always been silent, but not anymore. I'll be divorcing you after the wedding is over. That's what you get for being bad to everyone around you. She was chased out of the building. My mom got a new dress for me and also a makeup artist. With my mother-in-law forgotten, our wedding went just as we wanted. My father-in-law truly divorced her afterward and sent her out of his house. My mom got us a mansion in the UK, so we sold the house my father-in-law lived in, and all relocated to the UK. I heard my mother-in-law got a very small apartment after none of her family members agreed to take her in, due to her dirty attitude. I also got to know that she's been working as a waitress at a small restaurant. Well, I'm expecting my first child, and I'm happy having Steve, my mom, and father-in-law around me. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment down below saying I subscribed and we will try our best to reply to your comment. My own brother had robbed a bank while pretending to be me, and I was now a wanted man. Just then there was a loud knock on the door. Police, open up. I opened the door and was met with a swarm of policemen with their weapons drawn and pointed at me. Andrew, you're under arrest for burglary. You won't be seeing daylight for a very long time. No, I swear it wasn't me. It was my evil twin brother. Yeah, right. We've heard that one before. Nice try. Now come with us. My name is Andrew, and I'm a 26-year-old teacher. I love teaching. It's the best way I can give back to future generations. And after all, the world needs good teachers. Anyways, I live a very quiet life in a small town. I don't go out much, and I spend my nights playing chess most of the time. So you can imagine my surprise when I was abruptly arrested for a bank robbery, a crime I did not commit. It didn't take long to figure out what had really happened, and I'm gonna explain everything that led up to my evil twin brother, almost causing me to rot in prison. Growing up, my twin brother Kyle was always the favorite. Even as a toddler, he would throw tantrums and scream and cry when he wanted something, but instead of reprimanding him, my parents would just give him what he wanted. One day when we were both 13, we were all sitting down for a family dinner when Kylie said he wanted to make an announcement. Go ahead, son. Tell us what's on your mind. What could this possibly be about? Shut up, Andrew. You're not allowed to speak at the dinner table. Only Kyle is. This is why Kyle is our favorite. He would never act this way. Go ahead, Kyle. Ignore your brother and tell us your announcement. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I was arrested earlier for shoplifting and I have to go to court and will need a ride. Okay, that's no problem, son. I will drive you to court, then we will go get ice cream after. I couldn't believe my ears when I heard that my parents were not going to punish Kyle for shoplifting. He could do no wrong in their eyes, and I was just going to have to deal with it. Of course, this behavior only got worse as Kyle was not learning right from wrong because of bad parenting. Also, things continuously got worse as Kyle began to realize he was the favorite and started bullying me because of it. Hey Andrew, guess what? What? Mom and Dad love me so much more than you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Tomorrow we are going on a vacation to the beach without you. You're mean. I hate being your twin. One day you'll get what's coming to you. Nobody can act this way and get away with it. Yeah right, I'll never get in trouble. Earlier today I was robbing the elderly and nobody caught me. Tonight, I plan on stealing kids' bikes and reselling them. I love crime. It was clear there was no steering Kyle in the right direction. He was a lost cause. As I grew up, I distanced myself from my toxic family as much as possible and worked hard in school and eventually graduated with a degree in education. My parents didn't even come to see me get my diploma because they were too busy taking Kyle on a shopping spree. Kyle had decided not to go to college and instead committed to a life of crime. His crimes were slowly starting to grow, and one day he even called me and confessed to robbing a liquor store, which was his biggest crime yet. I tried one last time to get him to change his ways, but he just called me a loser and hung up. I decided I should go talk to my parents after years of not seeing them to try and fix this situation. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Why are you even here? We only love Kyle. Hasn't that been clear to you? Yes, you've made that very clear. I wanted to talk to you about Kyle. I'm worried about him. He's a horrible person, but he is my twin brother, and I still care about him. I think we should send him to rehab and get him off of his crime spree. Andrew, Kyle is fine. All he needs is our love and support, and that's what we're going to give him. Now get out of my house, you little weasel. 
That was the last time I ever spoke to my parents. They had gone too far. The next day, I saw in the newspaper that there was a huge bank robbery in my hometown and that they were searching for the perpetrator. I almost passed out when they showed a picture from the security cameras and it was my twin brother wearing an outfit that I would wear. I looked closer and realized that he was wearing a name tag that said, Andrew, and it was clear to me what had happened. My own brother had robbed a bank while pretending to be me, and I was now a wanted man. Just then there was a loud knock on the door. Police, open up. I opened the door and was met with a swarm of policemen with their weapons drawn and pointed at me. Andrew, you're under arrest for burglary. You won't be seeing daylight for a very long time. No, I swear it wasn't me. It was my evil twin brother. Yeah, right. We've heard that one before. Nice try. Now come with us. I was thrown in jail for a crime I didn't even commit, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I tried to explain to everyone what was going on, but nobody listened. I knew there was only one way to set things right. I was going to have to catch my brother myself. This was going to be exceptionally hard considering I was in prison, but after thinking all night I finally had a plan. I demanded that I receive my one phone call and asked for my call to be monitored by an officer. Once I knew the officer was listening in to my call, I dialed my brother's phone number. I knew I would be able to get my brother to confess, just like he had in the past. Hello? Andrew? Yep, it's me. I just saw my face on the news. They are saying that I am wanted for a bank robbery. Be honest with me though, you're the one that actually robbed that bank and then you set me up, didn't you? Yep, you're 100% correct. I'll admit it. I set you up. It was just too easy because we look exactly alike. I knew you would get blamed instead of me. So you were the one who robbed the bank? Yes. I already said that it was me. Are you hard of hearing or something? And where are you now? I'm hiding out in mom and dad's basement until the heat dies down. I have millions of dollars now, and I'm going to get to spend it while you rot in prison after they catch you. Ha ha. I win and you lose. At last, the truth was revealed. My plan had worked, and my brother was finally going to face justice. I was quickly released from prison, and I showed the police to my parents' house. The police quickly rushed inside and apprehended my brother. I got to witness the whole thing as my brother was hauled away in handcuffs. But it got even better when I saw my parents being arrested for helping aid a known felon. They were going to get at least two years in prison because they were helping my brother hide out in their basement. Well, 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 look how things played out. Honey, I'm sorry, I loved you all along. We should have treated you better. Well, that's easy to say now, isn't it? Your mom is right, son. You were the good one all along. Kyle has got us arrested. He's dead to us now. We love you. Sorry, but I'm not interested in having any kind of relationship with you. Have fun rotting in prison. Just then, a police officer approached me and told me he had great news. The millions of dollars my brother had stolen was going to be rewarded to me instead. Apparently, it was a gift since I had helped crack the case and I was now a millionaire. The look on my parents' face when they realized this was happening was priceless. My brother heard about it too, and he immediately started crying like a baby. Son, now that you're rich, surely you'll bail us out, right? Absolutely not. Now get out of my sight. They were finally hauled off to jail, and I went with them just to see it happen. Afterwards, I began spending my millions on different things. For one, I was able to retire from teaching and immediately took a vacation to the best beach in the world. I bought fancy cars and even donated $100,000 to charity. Then I reported the police officers who arrested me without doing any investigation. One even punched me that day and gave me black eye, and they were fired because they didn't do their job properly and didn't even listen to me. I saw in the newspaper a couple weeks later that my parents had been sentenced to two years in prison for hiding a criminal. As for my brother, well, when they heard how horrible he had been to me all my life and how he had set me up, they gave him the maximum sentence possible, 20 years. Some people think I should have bailed my family out and taken care of them, but I don't think so. What do you think? Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Oh, just stop it. She's just overreacting to a small amount of smoke.
Besides, what are you going to do about it? You have no backbone, you cowardly ass. Oh? See, that's where you're wrong. I can handle when you're cruel to me, but if you think that I'm going to stand idly by while you are cruel to my wife and future child, then you are incredibly stupid. If you really want to know what I'll do, then I'll show you. She tried to once again slap me, but I grabbed her arm and prevented her from doing so. I then snatched the cigarette from out of her mouth and put it in the palm of her hand and then squeezed her fingers so that she made a closed fist around the still burning cigarette. Once it was extinguished, I threw her over my shoulder and carried her to the front door, which I opened and then tossed her out and locked the door behind her. Hi there, let me start off by saying that I'm a very calm and very patient person, but my mother-in-law pushes my buttons and recently, she pushed me way too far. My wife Shirley had warned me early on that her mother was a very acquired taste, but I always thought that maybe she just could be a bit hard to handle. However, I was incredibly naive. My wife and I met a few years ago. Both of us weren't that lucky when it came to dating and had dated some terrible people. So when we bumped into each other at a cafe and struck up a conversation, we were on guard. But the more we got to know each other, the more we began to fall in love. It was a shame that we hadn't met each other sooner in our lives. At any rate, our relationship quickly grew, and after only eight months, we were engaged. Around that time is when Shirley first introduced me to her mother. She'd already met my parents by that time, and they absolutely adored her just as much as I did. So I assumed that my meeting with Shirley's mother would probably go just as well. Shirley never knew her father as he had left her mother soon after she had become pregnant. And so I felt a bit at ease since I figured that I would only have to meet one parent that it would be easier. Boy, was I wrong. Hey, mom, I want you to meet my fiance, Matthew. Hi there, it's very nice to meet you. Huh, is this the man you wish to marry? He's kind of chubby, don't you think? Mom, don't say things like that. And what do you do for a living, Matt? It's Matthew, actually, but I work as a production manager for a car manufacturer. That's it? Well, Matt, not only are you chubby, but you're also way too poor. You're not remotely good enough to marry my daughter. Mom, stop it. Matthew is the man of my dreams, and I can't believe you would treat him like this. Sadly, things between us only got worse the closer to the wedding we got. My future mother-in-law would always take every opportunity to take shots at me. I did have a bit extra weight when I met her, but I was working out every other day, and by the time the wedding rolled around, I had six-pack abs. She found issue with that as well. Oh, isn't that nice? You lost some weight. Yes, it took a lot of effort, but thank you for noticing. Oh, I noticed. I'm just assuming you lost the weight so you can attract other women. Just how many women are you sleeping with? What? No one. Your daughter is the only woman that I want to sleep with. I would never cheat on her. Why would you say something like that? Don't you dare talk back to me. She then slapped me across the face. I was shocked, but I also didn't know how to respond. Later, when I was alone with Shirley, I told her about what had happened, and she shyly shrugged. I'm so sorry, hun. My mother has always been that way. I can't tell you how many times she's hit me over my life. There's really nothing we can do about it, unfortunately. I sighed and resigned myself to having to put up with her continuing to be a terrible person. At any rate, we went ahead with the wedding. It was such a beautiful day. Shirley was so gorgeous in her wedding dress, and the weather was absolutely perfect. We could not have had a better day. A few months after we were married, we started making plans to have a baby and began trying when suddenly Shirley started feeling odd. For a few days, we got excited as we thought that maybe it was morning sickness. But when Shirley went to the doctors, they told her that she wasn't pregnant and that they were concerned. She was feeling nauseous and was beginning to look rather pale as well. The doctors were stumped and so they ran test after test trying to figure out what was wrong. After days of nonstop poking, Shirley and I were exhausted and frustrated when things took a turn for the worse. Shirley suddenly became short of breath and had difficulty breathing. Thankfully, the doctors gave her an inhaler and it helped her to breathe, but they were no closer to figuring out what the actual problem was. Terrified, we put our faith in doctors and hoped that they would figure out what was causing the issue. One day after work, I came home to find Shirley sitting on the couch and looking very upset. Hey, hun, what's wrong? Did you hear from the doctors? No. No, I just got a call from my mom. She was evicted from her apartment, and she wanted to know if she could come and stay with us for a bit. Eh, well, you know how I feel about her. And with you and your condition, I don't think it's such a good idea. I know. It's just that she has nowhere else to go, and she is really guilt-tripping me about it. Please. 
Could she please just stay with us for a little while? I was adamantly against it. But in the end, I knew that my wife would feel terrible if something were to happen, her mother and we had turned her away. And so, I agree, but only that she could stay with us for a few months at the most. Shirley promised that that would be the case, but deep down, I doubted that she would be able to keep that promise. The next week when she moved in, we made up the spare bedroom for her, and I made it certain that it was to be a temporary thing. The day after she moved in, the doctor's office called to give us both good and bad news. The doctor told us after running the test. Shirley was pregnant, but she also had some lung issues, and so she had to avoid smoke by all means. It was such a crazy mixed bag of emotions. I was of course happy that she was pregnant, but with her illness, I was worried both for her and for the baby. Part of me wondered if her body could handle the stress of the baby on top of whatever was already affecting her. And on top of that, the stress from having her evil mother now living with us, and things were very tense. Thankfully, her mother left her alone, but that only meant that she picked on me all the more. I'm surprised that you were able to get my daughter pregnant at all. No doubt you must have dozens of kids with all the women that you cheat on my daughter with. You're such a disgusting man. For the last time, I would not, nor have I ever cheated on your daughter. I love her, and only her. Will you just let it go already? Oh, don't lie to me. I know how all of you men are. Such disgusting creatures. You're just like my ex-husband. Is that why you hate me so much? You think that I'm the same kind of man as Shirley's father? I don't just think it, I know it. Well, you're wrong. I would never abandon her or our child the way her father did. But with a woman as obnoxious as you, I can imagine why he did. I knew that I had overstepped, and she slapped me hard across the face. Just as before, I didn't do anything, although she was wearing a ring, and it scratched my face pretty badly when she hit me. Although it did make me very angry, I chose to swallow down that anger and just ignore her. So long as she was attacking me, and only me, then I would take it. But of course, that wasn't to be the case. Within a few weeks, Shirley's mother began to get way more comfortable with our house than she had a right to. She would leave dirty dishes all over the place, and even started stealing cloths from us to wear instead of washing her own. All of that irritated me, but I could handle it to a degree. But then she started smoking inside the house. We had told her that we couldn't stop her from smoking, but that she could only do it outside since it affected Shirley. Apparently, she decided that she no longer had to follow that rule, and she began chain smoking in the house. I thought that I had smelt it, but I got confirmation when Shirley texted me while I was at work. She told me that she was having a very hard time breathing and begged me to come home and say something to her mother. Leaving work, I rushed home and found the living room filled with smoke and my mother-in-law sitting on the couch watching TV while smoking. Shirley was in the corner of the room desperately using her inhaler and struggling to breathe. I saw red and stormed over to her mother and confronted her. Damn it, we told you not to do that in the house. Why can't you respect our wishes? Can't you see the damage you are causing to your daughter and your future grandchild? Oh, just stop it. She's just overreacting to a small amount of smoke. Besides, what are you going to do about it? You have no backbone, you cowardly ass. Oh? See, that's where you're wrong. I can handle when you're cruel to me. But if you think that I'm going to stand idly by while you are cruel to my wife and future child, then you are incredibly stupid. If you really want to know what I'll do, then I'll show you. She tried to once again slap me, but I grabbed her arm and prevented her from doing so. I then snatched the cigarette from out of her mouth and put it in the palm of her hand and then squeezed her fingers so that she made a closed fist around the still burning cigarette. Once it was extinguished, I threw her over my shoulder and carried her to the front door, which I opened and then tossed her out and locked the door behind her. Thankfully, she didn't have the spare key that we gave her when she moved in and once she was out of the house. I went and grabbed all of her stuff and I threw it out onto the front lawn. She started breaking things outside, but the neighbors called the cops who came and escorted her out of the property. When they were taking her away, I said, make sure to never come back. Thankfully, once Shirley was able to breathe normally again, she agreed with what I had done and she apologized for having let her mother stay for so long. In the end, we got a restraining order against her mother preventing her from coming anywhere near us or our baby ever again. Within a couple weeks after kicking her out, we found out that the only place that she was able to move into was a very run-down nursing home. It serves her right, especially since the staff is known to be mean and disrespectful to the people that live there. The one time that we visited her there, she had a black eye and a split lip and told us that she had fallen in the shower, but we knew better. That one time was more than enough, really. 
and I would be lying if I said that seeing her, that depressed and lonely didn't make me feel good. She was a horrible bully and a rotten mother. As for us, I'm happy to say that Shirley's odd symptoms went away as mysteriously as they appeared, and just in time for her to give birth to a happy and healthy baby boy. Both of us have vowed to make that little boy's life infinitely better than the one that Shirley's mother gave her. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and leave a comment down below saying I subscribed, and we will try our best to reply to your comment.